Wonderful, love to see you. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about joy. Hope you guys have some joy in your life. Everybody have some joy in their life, anybody? A few of you? Cool. All right. Well, I do too. Let's, uh, let's open in prayer and then we'll get started here. Uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you again that we can meet together in this house of worship, Lord, that's dedicated to you. Help us, Lord, as we uh, go through some messages here today that we're drawn closer to you and uh, help us to be uh, good ambassadors for you during this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, all right. Well, last week we talked about all the prophecies that led up to Jesus and how God always keeps his word and he made sure that people knew things were coming uh, as far as Jesus goes. And I think we said that Jesus fulfilled like 300 prophecies in his lifetime and the odds of doing that were like one in trillion, 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 like really like one with 10 to 57 zeros after it. Okay. That's a, that's a lot. That's a crazy. That's a lot, right? Well, today we're, we're, we're going to be talking more about the anticipation of Jesus coming. Okay. And, uh, just as we experience the excitement and joy as Christmas approaches, we're going to examine the emotions of Mary, the shepherds and others involved in the anticipation of Jesus's birth. We will explore how our anticipation parallels the anticipation of the prophecies being fulfilled and how it was a cause for celebration, right? And we still experience the joy of anticipation as we await our Savior's second coming, which we'll get back into after the first of the year. Promise, we're not, we're not leaving that series. We're just taking a break as we go through Christmas here, all right? So, has anybody ever had something coming up that you were really excited about and joyful about and it wasn't necessarily that you were there uh, yet but you knew it was coming so, so today what i want to do is talk about uh, the main points are going to be that joy can be found in what will be and not what is as, as we anticipate it all right joy can also be found as good news will bring good, great joy and finally, we're going to look at joy on the other side. So let's go back to that first point here, okay? Joy can be found in what will be and not just what is. Anybody have any family traditions that they do as they prepare for Christmas or the holiday seasons that brings you joy? It's not Christmas yet, but um, I know my wife loves to watch Hallmark movies, and that brings her great joy all the time, okay? Uh, when I was a kid, we would always go out and... Uh, it wasn't actually Christmas, but it was one of the things that brought us joy. There was a giant oil, or yeah, an oil uh, container, huge in, in Orange County, and they always painted it to look like a giant pumpkin every year, right? And our parents would drive us out there, and we'd see this giant pumpkin uh, painted on the side of a, a fuel container. I, what do they call those? It was giant. It, was, it wasn't a well because it was above ground. It was like a silo of oil, right? It was a 76 thing, but they painted the thing as a pumpkin, and we always looked forward to that. It was kind of a stupid thing, you know, but, but as kids, it was kind of neat to see this giant pumpkin, right, coming up for Halloween. We had some other things that we would do that would bring us joy. I remember that when we were kids, we would never have a Christmas tree until December 24th. Yeah, we had no Christmas tree in our house. And then usually on, the, on Christmas Eve, and this was before, you know, we had, there were aluminum trees and, you know, <laughs> and things like that, right? Well, we would go out and find a Christmas tree, and that was joy for us, you know. Uh, that was the time we would bring it back on that day and then decorate it that night. Uh, I'll tell you what, but putting tinsel on was not joy for me. My mother would put it on one strand at a time. I, I just took it and threw it, right? Hey, you can't do that. That's not the way to do it. Anyway, but it was joyful doing that. So we're going to be looking here in the account of Luke about joy. All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's pick this up. Uh, I'm going to tell you here, there, there was a woman named Elizabeth, and we, we talked about that a little bit this morning while well, we read about it in the Bible, how that the angel Gabriel, when he appeared to Mary, he said Elizabeth was in her sixth month, and she was barren. Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary, right? And so... Mary goes and visits the mother of, uh, well, the mother of John, who's going to be born to her, but it's basically Elizabeth, right? So she visits Elizabeth, and the two of them are pregnant. And she goes to visit Elizabeth in her sixth month. And 
Well, here's the interaction here. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So she's got this great news. She's going to have a baby, but she goes and visits her cousin. I see why God chose Mary. She had a really nice heart, didn't she? Okay, I mean, as, as Christians, we don't worship Mary, but she was, I mean, she was cream of the crop as far as this creation goes. I, I, I see, right? So she's pregnant herself, but she goes to visit her cousin to help her out, right? And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. How wonderful, right? Here's Jesus, not born yet, but, you know, uh, John, who's the, the baby is going to be named John eventually. He's leaping in her womb with joy, and she can feel that because she's in her sixth month, right? And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And, of course, the fruit she's talking about is Jesus, right? And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, how did Elizabeth know that Mary was going to be the mother of Jesus? The Bible doesn't tell us that happened. It just says that, you know, that she was going to give birth to someone to bring forth the Messiah. But, but anyway, uh, I think God gave her special knowledge about that, right? And for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So she's telling Mary how wonderful it was, and even John's leaping for joy here at this point. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. So as Mary arrives in Elizabeth's home, the baby inside of Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. The text seems to tell us that the reason for Elizabeth and her baby's, that's John the Baptist, joyful response is that Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus inside of her womb. Just the presence of Jesus being close has a power effect, powerful effect on everyone who is present in this home. Isn't that great? I mean, and, and you know, and at this point, you know, Jesus as a human hasn't done anything yet. But still, what joy that brings, right? Elizabeth praises Mary for her belief in God and her willingness to submit to the plan of God that would be birthed into the world through her womb. When I read this text, I wonder to myself, what is it that she and the baby are so excited about? Well, the Lord Elizabeth is speaking of is still an unborn baby. He still hasn't done anything yet, like I said, right? Perhaps we can learn something here. What if we can experience joy in our lives today, not because of how things are now, but because of what could be in the future by the intervention of God, by God, amen? Elizabeth and her child are rejoicing in what was going to result from Jesus' long-anticipated birth. And remember how long that anticipation was, all the way from the beginning of creation and, until this point, right? Elizabeth and her child are rejoicing in what was going to result from Jesus' long-anticipated birth. Notice what Elizabeth says in verse 45. Now, I'm going to put up the uh, New American, the NIV version for you here because I like the way it says it here. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Mary is blessed because she trusted and believed in something that had not yet come to pass. She believed to God right? Sometimes just anticipating God showing up can be enough to fulfill our, spirit, uh, to fill our spirits and lift, lift us up, right? Okay, so let's go to a modern day now. In the, mo in the classic Christmas show, A Charlie Brown Christmas, <laughs> Charlie Brown was having trouble getting into the Christmas spirit because of the commercialization of the season, right? Uh, well, you know what? Why don't I just show you a clip?
there must be something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I just don't understand Christmas, I guess. I like getting presents and sending Christmas cards and decorating trees and all that, but I'm still not happy. I always end up feeling depressed. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Maybe Lucy's right. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. Take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. <laughs> and of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. <laughs> that's, that's quite a statement there, right? Well, unfortunately, some Christians seem to have the same problem as Charlie Brown. We should be celebrating what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection could mean in our lives and should mean in our lives, rather than bemoaning all the things that can be found wrong in a season like this. Don't you agree? All right, we can find a reason to be downtrodden or gloomy, but we can also find the gift of God's presence with us in Jesus. Maybe you're still waiting on God to do something in your life. Maybe you're still anticipating uh, an answer to a sorrowful prayer. Here's the truth. God is not done yet. Amen? God is not done yet. Okay? Uh, he is always on the move. Whether we are in his, whenever we are in his presence, whenever we are walking with Jesus... Anything is possible. Just like Jesus' presence in Mary, when she was near Elizabeth, brought forth joy, his presence in our life can and should do the same for us. All right? And that brings me to point number two. There we go. Good news brings great joy. Another set of characters in the story of Christmas is the shepherds. All right, we hear about these every year, but the shepherds, just a reminder, they were a class of people that were not well thought of in first century Jewish culture. They lived out in the fields day after day watching sheep. They were smelly, dirty, and known to be rather untrustworthy. It's interesting to me then that the message of Jesus' birth comes to them first, but it does. Uh, and we can see this in Luke 2, 8 through 15. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. Just love that sore afraid, right? <laughs> and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Well, that's great news, but it doesn't end there. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. These are the same men that reject God. These are the same people that sin. God, the angel is here saying, the angels are saying that we have glo glory to God and peace to man because of what Jesus is going to do for us on the cross, right? And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. In the middle of the night outside of Bethlehem, an angel appears to the shepherds. The Bible says it was marked by a great light. When the shepherds saw this, they were terrified. This was not a normal occurrence, right? Uh, the angel brings a message for them that is good news. The reason is good news is because why? It's going to bring great joy to all people. When we receive good news, it makes us happy. It causes us to be joyful. I remember when Denise and I, we were first married, you know, married years ago, and then a few years later, uh, she was pregnant. We told our parents that we were going to have a grandchild for them, and they were, they were very happy, joyful. Why? Because the baby coming brings great joy. There's joy over a new baby coming into the family. Well, what makes the message angel give great news? Verse 11 tells us. They are given reason 
to rejoice because for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now I realize Linus probably says this better in a Christmas, Charlie Brown Christmas, okay? But I don't want to put, you know, I don't want that to be the whole sermon. So I'm, I'm speaking this here. But uh, so here you go. Verse 11 tells us, they are given a reason to rejoice and spread the word because a Savior has come to earth. He is the Messiah, which means the anointed one, who is the Lord. There is joy in the birth of a Savior because they needed and we need to be saved from our sin and brokenness. There is joy because Jesus the Messiah, who is the Lord, he is the anointed one who will lead us with love. In Sunday school this morning, we started the book of Romans, and the first chapter is how bad man is. Okay, the, and we, we went over that today. And how far from God we are before we have Jesus bringing that relationship back to God. He comes in the middle there, and, and basically, you know, God's here, we're here. Jesus comes in the middle, grabs our arm, and pulls us towards him, right? That's, that's what Jesus did for us. That's an amazing thing. Here's the good news. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Jesus gives us access to a holy God. Jesus gave us his righteousness and the promise of eternal life. Jesus promised never to leave us or forsake us. This is great news. And the Bible says it is for how many people? All people, right? Which shall be to all people. Even, you know... Someone on a deserted island somewhere, Jesus dying on the cross and rising again from the dead for them, that was for that person. And God can make that known to them. I believe that with all my heart. Like the Bible says, all men are without excuse. So he is not just the savior of some or the Lord of most. <coughs> he is overall and gave his life to rescue all people. It was not just good news for the shepherds then. It is good news for us today, amen? It is. It's good news today, right? Uh, this is why we can live with joy and share this good news with others. The baby Jesus was born, and that one fact changes everything in history, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus Christ, born to a virgin in Bethlehem, roots Christianity in history. It's not once upon a time. <laughs> it's not a long time ago. It's not uh, in a, a place far away. The Bible tells us there's a time and a place where it actually happened. And because of that, Christianity is true, and I rejoice for that. We're not just, you know, worshiping some God that we're making up. You know, like Paul says, we didn't, or Peter said, he said, we didn't invent a bunch of stories. This is, we were eyewitnesses of this. Well, the shepherds are eyewitnesses of this. And they go, of course, right? So our celebration at Christmas only makes sense, though, when we look at the Easter that is to come. And that's part three, looking at joy on the other side, right? The birth of Jesus that we've talked about in chapters one and two of Luke are only the beginning of what the Savior came to do. That's right. The Gospel of Luke doesn't end in chapter two, does it? It ends with the resurrection of Jesus. Amen, right? Okay. Uh, so it becomes clear later in the Gospels that Jesus was born into the world so that one day he might die on the cross for our sins. The arrest, trial, and crucifixion was too horrific. The pain he went through was terrible. However, the Bible says that even in the middle of it, Jesus had joy. Why? Because he knew it was on the other side. And now we're going to leave the Gospels and go to Paul's, well, people think it's, it's Paul. It could be Paul. It could be a, a student of Paul, but it's from Hebrews. Hebrews 12.2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are told that Jesus suffered the cross, he took on the shame and humiliation of death because there was joy that was ahead of him. Wow, this sounds really foreign to someone outside of Christianity. What do you mean joy? Joy in a crucifixion? Yeah, yeah. What was the joy on the other side of the suffering and pain? You and me. Jesus dying for us, right? 
The joy set before him was the fact that because of his sacrifice, you and I would be given the opportunity to receive his gift of grace and experience freedom from sin. Hear that? It's the opportunity, not the guarantee. We still have to do something. We have to accept it, right? I mean, if, if someone hands you a gift and you walk away from it, did you receive the gift? No. You've got to take the gift with open arms, right? And God wants us to do that, right? So we are told that uh, when Jesus did this, the reason Jesus could have joy in the darkest time of his life was because he anticipated the resurrection. You see, Elizabeth and the baby inside of her womb celebrated because of what Jesus would do in saving the world. The shepherds were given good news that would cause great joy for all people. Jesus endured the cross and knew that joy was on the other side. One of the reasons we enter the Christmas season with joy is because we know that no matter what we are experiencing now, because of Jesus, we can look forward to joy in the future. And I'm not just talking about joy in heaven forever. That's wonderful. That's amazing. It's going to happen. But joy on earth, anticipating the eternal joy that is to come. That still brings us joy here. Sometimes we feel like we must feel joyful to be joyful. The truth is, though, that even when Jesus was facing the cross, I'm sure he did not feel joy. Even though he did not feel joy, he chose to persevere through difficulty nonetheless. And we can do the same. He endured the pain to enter the promise. And again, we can do the same. Dwight Moody said it well. And I have this up here. It's kind of long, so I'll read it to you, though. It says, Happiness is caused by things that happen around me, and circumstances will mar it. But joy flows right on through trouble. Joy flows on through the dark. Joy flows in the night as well as the day. Joy flows all through persecution and opposition. It is an unceasing fountain bubbling up in the heart, a secret spring the world can't see and doesn't know anything about. The Lord gives his people perpetual joy when they walk in obedience to him. Now, walking in obedience means keeping our eyes focused on him, as Hebrews 12 passage states, right? We are tempted from time to time to lose sight of where our joy comes from. It's good to have a reminder every once in a while. And that's one of the reasons I, I love that we do the Christmas season every year and do Easter every year, because as humans, we tend to forget. If we were just to do it like every five years, we'd be like, you know, we, I, I, I think the, those next, those four years in between wouldn't be so good for us, right? Uh, this Christmas, though, I want to challenge you to make a conscious effort to celebrate with joy because of what Jesus has done for you, all right? Think about this. How can trusting in God's plan bring you joy? Why is it fun to share good news with other people? Anybody ever like go to a great restaurant and you want to just share that with somebody, right? Well, we got something better than a restaurant, ladies and gentlemen, right? We have the eternal salvation with Jesus. We should be joyful and wanting to share that with that, okay? Uh, what does it mean to choose joy even when life is hard? Who thinks that Mother Teresa had a pretty hard life? But you know what? She was joyful. She was there helping those people all the time, right? Uh, and there are lots of uh, illustrations of martyrs and, and, and saints in the past that had a joyful life. Paul, Paul was in Rome, ready to be executed. And he was joyful because he said, you know, absent from the body means present with the Lord. He wasn't worried about it. He had a joy that flowed through him that was infectious, that people saw, right? So, as we wrap up today, let's think of one practical way to share the joy of the Lord Jesus with others around you this Christmas season. It could be getting your family together where everyone brings some sort of dish and spends time around the table laughing and sharing stories and tell them what, tell your unsaved family members what Jesus means to you and why you're a Christian. Maybe they never heard it. Maybe they have. Maybe they still need to hear it again. I don't know. It could be inviting a friend over to play a board game and sharing one another the blessings in life that you're so thankful for. And then again, sharing your testimony. Okay? Or maybe your joy 
could be shared with someone down the street just by taking some baked goods or a card to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Anyway, it's Christmas time. It's the season. And as they say, share the joy of Jesus with others. Amen. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you that you've given us joy today, Lord. You can give us joy every day because of what Jesus did for us. Help us, Lord, to share that joy with others. Help us to be a good example of what it means to be a, a Christian so that people will come up to us and ask us, what joy do we have in our life that they need? And then give us the strength and the courage to share that with them. In Jesus' name, amen. And as you saw, most of the songs we sang this morning were about joy, and uh, it only makes sense then that we wrap up with joy to the world.